All right, so here we have a polynomial. Here we have the highest degree term. So the leading term of the polynomial is negative one fifth x squared. Now, the leading coefficient is the number in front of the highest power term. So the leading coefficient here is negative one fifth. The degree of the polynomial is the highest power, the highest power in the polynomial. So the degree is two. And the name for degree two polynomial is quadratic. Okay. Now down here, they're tricking you because what should be the leading term is not. So we have to write this in the correct order for everything to make sense. Here's the highest power term right there. We need to write this in descending order. So X to the fourth, plus 4x to the third, plus negative five, but I don't have to write it that way, minus 5x squared. Now here's the highest power term, so it's the leading, the leading term and you don't see a coefficient, you don't see a number in front of it. So that means the leading coefficient is one. Okay, the degree is the highest power term. I mean, it's the highest power. So the degree is four, right there, right there. And this is called a quartic. When the highest power is four, it's called a quartic. And I'm even going to add something else that you're going to need to know in just a few minutes. And that is that this is um, an even degree. In other words, four is an even number. In fact, the previous problem, two. Two is an even number. And something I want you to pay attention to, and like I said, you'll see in just a few minutes, is that the highest degree is even, which means the degree of the polynomial is even. So the highest power equals the degree and it's even. The leading coefficient is negative. Why do we care? You'll know. The leading term is negative. Those are gonna be very, very, very important. That's why they jumped back to um, the first few problems my math lab has. The first few problems being to analyze polynomials. All right, same thing. The degree is even, the degree of the polynomial is four. So the degree is even. And the leading coefficient is positive. And then finally, here we have a problem written in descending order. 
a polynomial written in descending order. Its degree is three. The leading term, the highest power term, is negative one third X to the third power. The leading coefficient is the number in front of the variable. The degree is the actual highest power, three. And cubic polynomials, highest degree three, are called cubics. Now three is an odd number, a number that two will not go into evenly. So the degree of the polynomial, the degree is odd, and the leading coefficient is negative. Okay, now this part's pretty easy. This part we've gone over before multiple times and, and I'm sure that it's familiar to you. It should be, even coming back from spring term. A spring break, spring break. Okay, this, this, well, you're supposed to watch the video and then this will be explained to you. But let's skip this and come back to it. What we're going to be talking about now is called end behavior. This is actually fun. It's fun and it's easy. OK, so there are just really four things you need to know. So let's get the calculator. You need to know what Y equals X squared looks like. Kind of looks like a U. It's a parabola. Now here, the end behavior of y equals x squared is not what happens in the middle, but what happens out on the left end and the right end. That's what we're concerned about with end behavior. Graphs can do all kinds of weird stuff in the middle, but what are they gonna do out on the end? Well, okay, so this you really, really, really need to memorize, generally speaking, what y equals x squared looks like. And you need to memorize what y equals negative x squared looks like. Notice the end behavior is down on the left and down on the right. Like that. Whereas the end behavior of y equals x squared is up on the left and up on the right like this. This is the end behavior of all polynomials that have an even degree. And um, a leading term that's negative. like the first problem we dealt with. Tell me I didn't turn it off, good. Okay, let's just, 
kind of turn it off there. Um, the first problem we dealt with ha has an even degree. In fact, it's squared. And a negative leading term. So you know immediately, you don't even have to put it in the graphing calculator. You want to know immediately that the end behavior of this is going to be down on the left and down on the right. Now here we have a leading term four, which is even, and the leading term is positive. The end behavior of this is up on the left and up on the right. We're talking about at the ends. And when we're talking about end behavior, we're not talking about what happens in the middle, just at the ends. All right, so here's what you get when you have an even degree and a positive leading term. Like Like that. It's not what they're asking here, but here we have um, um, an even degree and a positive leading coefficient. So we don't know what that looks like. I mean, my Lord. But what we do know is that out on the ends, it's going to go up on the left and up on the right. We know it immediately, just by looking at the leading term and the leading coefficient. Look at that, isn't that ugly? Ooh, but it's not a problem when we're talking about end behavior. You don't need to know what it looks like except out at the ends. The degree is even. The leading coefficient is negative. So degree even. Leading coefficient. Is negative. That means we're going to be looking like this. End behavior. Now. What about odd? The model for odd degrees is y equals x to the third power. Now here we have a positive degree, I mean up, and an odd degree, and there's an understood one in front of that x to the third. So um, uh, uh, yeah, this is gonna be the end behavior. Up on the right, down on the left. Like this. This is odd degree. And positive leading term. So out on the ends, we don't know what it's doing in the middle, but
but out on the ends, it's going to go down on the left and up on the right forever, and it's never going to turn back around. So for this problem, that's the answer when you're asked about end behavior. And then, hmm, I need another negative, but I don't have it. So let me just tell you, that when you have an odd, odd degree and a negative leading coefficient, this is what you have, up on the left and down on the right. Now, these little symbols are perfect for you to make, um, um, flashcards with. So up on the left, down on the right means you have an odd degree and um, um, a negative leading coefficient. So let me stay consistent here. Leading term, negative. Over here, odd degree. And um, positive. Well, LT positive. So these are just, all right, yeah, this is just the perfect flashcard. All right, this stuff isn't hard, but it is important. Now, finally, we're going to answer the question, what is a zero? We've, we've already worked with it. And so you might have a seat of your pants understanding of what a zero is, a zero of a function. But now we're going to look at exactly what a zero of a function is. A zero of a function makes this equal zero. And so they're asking us, and you can already see what the answer is, they're asking us to test Four is four a zero of the function and use substitution. So we're going to find f of four. And what f of four is code for is stick a four in for every x. Okay, so for that, I go to the plain screen and I just put this in four carat three and then right arrow to come down minus 12 times four squared plus 17 times four plus 89 equals 29. 29 is not zero. A zero makes a function equal zero. So that's why the answer is no. We're going to spend a lot of time finding zeros of functions.
Okay, now here you can see the answer is yes. Use substitution to, to determine whether two is a zero of the following. They should have said the following function. All right, we'll try. F of two means two to the third minus 14 times two squared See, I, I don't have to use parentheses if the number is positive. I do have to use parentheses if the number is negative. All right, plus 19 times 2 plus 10. So now I'll do that. 2 carat 3 minus 14. Um, times two squared plus 19 times two plus 10. And that is zero. So that's why the answer is yes here. It's because, ah, uh, wrong, wrong problem. Helps to be on the right problem. Um, that's because this equals <clears throat> zero. A zero makes the function equal zero when you plug it in for the x's. That's how you know what a zero is. Why do we care? Because the zero of the function is the x-coordinate of the x-intercept. Why do we care? Because historically and currently, those are extremely important. If you put the profit function together, the x-intercepts are where the economy or where the economy of the business turns around. Probably the most important number especially if you own your own business. Um, okay, so we're going to do this again. I think you get the idea, though. You plug a 3 in for every x, stick it in your calculator, or do it by hand, and you should get a 0. Okay. Now we're going to look at why leading terms are so, so important. And why zeros, another reason why zeros are so, so important. And why multiplicity is important. Multiplicity is how many times a zero happens. So here we have a function that the My Math Lab people have been kind enough to already factor for us. And so we're going to continue here. Um, let's see, the factors that can be set equal to zero are x plus four equals zero and x plus four equals zero and x plus 4 equals 0, and x minus 5 equals 0. And so what do we get from this? We get x equals negative 4, x equals negative 4, x equals negative 4, and x equals positive 5. So that's why the zeros are 5 and negative 4, or negative 4 and 5. Order is not going to matter. Now, ah, and it's asking you about the multiplicity. Well, let's look. 
Multiplicity means how many times a zero happens. Negative four has multiplicity three because it happens three times. Five only happens once, so five has multiplicity one. Okay, so the smaller zero and the larger zero. Well, negative numbers are always smaller than positive numbers. So the negative zero, the smaller zero, has multiplicity three, and the larger zero, one, has, mul <laughs> has multiplicity one. That's what multiplicity is. That's all it is, which just shows the talent that mathematicians have for making a very simple comment, uh, comment, a very simple idea complicated. Okay, now we have to find the zeros of this. Let's come down here where there's more room. How do you find the zeros? Well, if a zero, let's say A is your zero, or let's just find a nice neutral, um, um, what's a good letter? E, no, F, no, nothing works. Let's just say that we have a number that's zero. You plug it in, that is A zero of the function. You plug it in for the X and you'll get F of X equals zero. You plug it in for the function three times whatever that number is. I mean, that number raised to the third power minus seven times that number squared minus that number plus seven equals zero. That's what the zero does. So what we're going to do is set. I was going to put it down there, but let me start it up here anyway. Zero equals x to the third minus seven x squared minus x plus seven. Because we want the value of x or the values of x, that will cause this to be zero. That's why we set it equal to zero. And you've been solving these for a while now. We're going to use grouping. X to the third minus. Seven X squared. Plus. Negative one X plus seven. And then we factor each set of parentheses by the LCD. So we'll pull out an X squared here, and that will leave us X minus seven. But with this, remember that when your leading term of what's in the parentheses there has a negative coefficient, you have to pull out a negative greatest common factor, GCF. So I'm going to rewrite this as negative one X plus negative one times negative seven. And I guess it would be better to put that in brackets because there are parentheses on the inside. Um, okay, so each of these terms has a negative one. Zero equals X squared times X minus seven 
plus negative one times, all right, the negative one is gone, that will leave us x minus seven. And so when we factor this, we're going to have x minus seven times x squared minus one. But x squared minus one factors by the difference of two squares. So we're going to have zero equals x minus seven times x plus one times x minus one. And then we set each factor equal to zero and solve x minus seven equals zero, x plus one equals zero, x minus one equals zero. Add seven to both sides, you get x equals seven. Subtract one from each side, you get x equals negative one. And add one to both sides, you get x equals one. So you have three zeros of this function. Each of these numbers will cause f of x to equal zero. So you plug a seven in for all these x's, you get zero. You plug a negative one in for all these x's, you get zero. You plug a positive one in for all of these zeros, uh, for all of these x's, you get zero because these are the zeros of the function. And how many times does each one happen? Each one happens once. So that's the multiplicity of each. Each zero has multiplicity one. And here are the zeros up here. One, negative one, and seven. Okay, so we've got zeros. We've got how you find zeros. You just set your polynomial equal to zero. And solve. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. But let's point out something else while we're here. the zeros make the x-intercepts when the zeros are real numbers, that is numbers in the real number system. So this zero will make the x-intercept seven zero. And this zero will make the x-intercept negative one zero. And this zero we'll make the x-intercept one, zero. Not to forget that. Okay, here you're gonna use u substitution. Know how to do that. Let's skip this for a moment and go down here because now we have a different kind of question. Find the zeros of the polynomial function and state the multiplicity of each. We have x to the third, we have x minus two squared, we have <clears throat> x plus four. So let's look at what that is. These, we're finding the zeros, so we set f of x equal to zero, which means we'll have zero equals x times x times x times 
x minus 2 times x minus 2, because it's x minus 2 squared, times x minus 4. Plus 4. Then you set each zero equal, uh, each factor equal to zero. So you're going to get x equals zero, x equals zero, x equals zero, x minus two equals zero, x minus two equals zero, x plus four equals zero. And of course, the quicker way to do this is to recognize that you could say, okay, well, this has got to be x minus something. It must be zero because there's no number with it. So this is going to be x minus zero to the third power, x minus two, well, squared, x plus four, one, and then just do this once. Okay, we're going to have x equals zero, and that has multiplicity three. We're going to have x equals two, because remember, x minus two equals zero is going to, after we add two to both sides, give us x equals two. So we're going to have x equals two, and that's going to happen this many times. Multiplicity two, and then we're going to have x plus four equals zero. And when we subtract four from both sides, we'll have x equals negative four. So x equals negative four has multiplicity one. So now they ask you that thing again, okay, the smallest zero is, well, it's negative four, because negative numbers are always less than any positive number. And it has multiplicity one. And the middle zero, well, zero is smaller than two, right? So if you were to graph these on the x-axis, the number line, you would have, if that's zero, then you would have a two over here and a negative four over here. And as you go to the left, numbers are considered to get smaller. And as you go to the right, numbers get bigger because left means less and right means the opposite of less, which is more. So the numbers go in this order. This is the smallest, this is the middle, this is the largest. This has multiplicity one, this has multiplicity three, and this has multiplicity two. Notice also that an X by itself is really X minus zero. Discussion about this. Okay. Well then. Now we're asked to do something that is really easy. I love it. We're going to look at the degree of the polynomial, and that's all we're looking at. Only the degree is smaller here, is important here. This um, polynomial has degree four. Here's what that means. It means that the largest number, the max, 
well, the maximum number of real zeros, that is zeros that are numbers on the x-axis. Those are the real zeros. Okay. The, the most it can have, the most zeros it can have, this function can have is four because the degree is four. And since real zeros, zeros in the real number system, zeros on the x-axis, are what make the x-intercepts, well, the most, maximum means most, the most x-intercepts that this function can have are four because of course the x-intercepts are made from the zeros. So these are gonna be the same. On the other hand, what's a turning point? A turning point are these, the maxima and minima. The maximum points and minimum points or if you prefer the relative maximum points and the relative minimum points. We talked about those the last time. Well, the most, the most turning points that this can have is one less than the degree. So the most turning points. Well, here, this has one, two, three, four, five, six. No, I certainly didn't graph that correctly. Whatever it has, the most it can have, and it can have less, but the most it can have is one, two, three. One, two, three turning points. Because the graph turns around, it goes from decreasing to increasing to decreasing to increasing. And of course, with an even degree, this is going to go up on the left and up on the right. Let's take a look at this horrible function. Thank goodness they're not asking us to find the zeros. Instead, all they're doing is, they're saying, well, what are the maximum number of real zeros? In other words, the most. The most. The most. The most real zeros that this can have, this f of x can have, are 10. So the most x-intercepts it can have is 10? Might be is 10. And the most turning points it can have is one less than 10, which is nine. This is just something you have to memorize. Or you can draw a picture and pictures can make it make sense too, if you want to figure it out, which is a good way to learn something. Okay, now look what we're being asked to find. Well, the same thing but they're trying to trick you. This is negative x to the fourth minus 5x. This is the leading term. So we know immediately, okay, the most x in our, um, the most real zeros, that is points on the x-axis that, are, that form the x-intercepts. The most real zeros we can have is four. 
So the most X intercepts I can have is four. And the most turning points we can have is three. And what else do you know? Well, it doesn't ask you about end behavior, but you know that with a negative one leading coefficient, this is going to go down on the left and down on the right. Because you've got an even degree. See how important the degree is. see how important the leading coefficient is. But here it's only the degree that's important to find the maximum number of real zeros, the maximum number of x-intercepts, and the maximum number of turning points. I have a question. <gasps> yes. So, so how did you get, get turning, turning points on this problem? problem? Pardon me? How did you get, did you get turning point points on this problem? Um, it's always going to be less than, than the degree. One less. One less than the degree. It's something you have to memorize. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so what have we talked about here? What have we talked about? We didn't do this problem, and we can do this problem, or you can do it yourself. Um, there are an amazingly large number of um, uh, use substitution problems here, but let's do this anyway. Find the zeros of the function. Well, what are the maximum number of zeros? Four. What is the maximum number of zeros? Four. Does that mean I'll find four? Well, looking at the answers, yes. But do I have to find four? No. There could be three. Or two. Uh, that gets complicated. And we will talk about it but we haven't talked about it yet, so let's let that question go. We're going to have to actually find the zeros here, but when you notice that four is two times two, four is two times the middle degree, two, then you know automatically, use substitution time. So we let u equal x squared. And then if we square u, we have to square the x squared. And that gives us x to the fourth. Because when you have a base raised to a power, raised to a power again, you multiply the powers. That's one of those rules of exponents. Um, so we now know that this can be u squared, and this can be minus 14u plus 45 Okay. And what are we being asked? Yeah. Okay, we're being asked these questions. No, 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 we're not. Here, we're being asked, find the zeros of the polynomial and state the multiplicity of each. All right, so let's do that. U squared minus 14U plus 45, and 45 equals 9 times 5, or negative 9 times negative 5, 
and negative 9 plus negative 5 is negative 14, which is your B number right here. And that's what these factors of 45 have to add up to. So since there's a 1, an invisible 1, in front of u squared, all we have to do is um, raise up that negative a little bit. u minus 9 times u minus 5. And I forgot to say equals 0. We're finding the zeros. I've got to say equals 0 because that's what this is all about. U minus 9 equals 0. U minus 5 equals 0. Add 9 to both sides. So U equals 9. Add 5 to both sides. So u equals 5. And the number one mistake people can make is to get this part right and then forget that they have to go back and find x. So notice that u equals x squared and the original function is in x. The real terrible truth is nobody cares what u equals. So if u equals 9, that means x squared equals 9. Uh, and if u equals 5, that means x squared equals 5. So I take the square root of both sides so I can get x. And when you use the square root method like this, you have to put a plus or minus the square root of the right hand side. And then the square root of x squared equals plus minus the square root of the right hand side, which is five. All right, the square root of nine is three. The square root of x squared is x, so x equals plus or minus 3, and x equals, well, plus or minus the square root of 5, which means your zeros are going to be negative 5 and, and negative the square root of 5, the square root of 5, negative 3 and 3, and each one occurs once. Those are your four real zeros. Each one occurs once. But while we're here, and while we have a few more minutes, and because it's important, I want to extend this a little bit and say, okay, you've got four real zeros. That's the maximum number, you cannot have more. Now, what are the x-intercepts that are made from the real zeros? Take each zero, you're going to be ne negative the square root of five, comma zero. Positive the square root of five, comma zero. Negative three, comma zero. and three comma zero. So 
if there are four real zeros, there are going to be four x-intercepts. Those x-intercepts are not always pretty. Now, what is the maximum number of turning points I can have? Four minus one, which is three. Not only that. Okay, maximum number of turning points is three. Max number turning points. In other words, relative maxima and minima. Three, always one less than the maximum number of zeros, or always one less than that. And one more question. All of this is fair game. Show the end behavior of this. Well, there's a positive one in front, and the degree is even, so the end behavior is going to be up on the left and up on the right. Meanwhile, the x-intercepts occur in the middle, what's considered the middle. So that has been what we've talked about today. Okay, we've talked about end behavior. We've talked about first, we've, we've dissected polynomials. What is the leading term? What is the leading coefficient? What is the degree of the polynomial? What is the name of the polynomial? Oh, we didn't do this. We can do it now. Use the leading term test, which is the same thing as end behavior. Use the leading term test to match the function below with this function right here. You can see what the answer is. Why? Because this is even degree. negative leading term. Which means it goes down on the down on the left. Down on the left and down on the right. Notice it looks for all the world like y equals x squared negative x squared. Do all, all court to, oh, oh my gosh, this doesn't have a special name. This is just a sixth, sixth degree polynomial. But yeah, we talked about basically easy ideas, but you have to memorize them. So I recommend, as always, putting them on flashcards. Not flashcards you buy, flashcards you make yourself. Because your body works when you're making flashcards that are your flashcards. And when you use those parts of the brain, then that part of the brain also goes into helping you remember. The more parts of your brain you can use to help you remember something, the better. Okay, I have nothing left to share unless you've got questions. And I will see you on Wednesday 
when we are going to do something pretty difficult. Again, it's going to take memorizing. So be ready to memorize. See you later.